Uh, hello, uh, my name is Hawken Hamer. I'm the Executive Officer of the Nordic Society of Human Genetics and Precision Medicine. And thank you uh, for coming to our uh, final event of this season. And um, I, uh, before we get into the uh, introductions uh, for the speakers today, Mark Daly, Yuka Koskula, and uh, Sani Rutsalainen uh, of FIM, uh, I just wanted to uh, mention one thing uh, first, which is, uh, oops, I'm gonna find my way to my slides here. Uh, uh, we are excited that we finally can say that there will be a meeting and it will be the 8th of 9th of November for the Nordic Society meeting. And um, we certainly expect it to be in person and we hope you can put it in your calendars now and make plans. Uh, we'll also be holding a workshop on COVID-19 Nordic response and research and uh, many other satellites and group meetings we hope. Uh, please contact us to make sure that uh, those of you who want to hold your network meetings um, can find space and more will be coming out on that very soon. And um, I also, before we uh, continue, I. I also wanted to uh, actually go back to here this slide. And um, I wanted to say thank you to all the speakers from the previous webinars, because it's been a great webinar season, uh, starting with uh, Kari Stefansson, Søren Brunak, <clears throat> Amelie Ripati, Paul Franks and Hugo Fittipaldi, Ola Andreasen and Alexander Fry, and then uh, Maurice, most recently, Lily Milani and Nima Tunnison. And um, you know, thanks to all of them for um, making this a great webinar season, and of course, to all the panelists who joined um, in, the, in these webinars. And so I think that uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to uh, Mark Daly from FIM. And Mark, you'll introduce the other speakers, correct? Absolutely. Hi, everyone. Great to be here. Thanks for the introduction, Hakan. I'm uh, Mark Daly. I'm director of FIM, the Institute for Molecular Medicine in uh, Finland in Helsinki. And I'm going to give a brief update and then introduce two very nice talks, which will be much more interesting than mine, from Jukka Koskola and Sami Ruotsalainen, um, eh, who will follow. And um, what we are going to do today is give a bit of an update from the, the Finnish frontier um, on FinGen and how we are using the national resources um, that are available to us in Finland to create a a research infrastructure that allows um, some of the work that you'll hear from Yuka and Sanni um, to discover new insights, functional variants into, into disease and take advantage of, of not only the sort of you know, traditional Nordic um, health registry system, but also the unique founding population of Finland. So without further ado, I give everybody a little bit of background on the FinGen project, which was launched in 2017. And I think this takes obvious advantage of the sort of unique Nordic um, relationship that the populations and the government um, have with healthcare and healthcare research in which an entire ecosystem that allows um, easy participation of Finnish citizens in research and you know, Nordic citizens in general have a much, much higher level of trust in medical research, in science and in their government than certainly people in my home country of the United States do, um, and probably for very good reasons. So our research is, is a sort of powered and enabled by um, a relatively unique um, national legislation in Finland, the Biobank Act of 2013, which allows individuals throughout the country to be, to be sort of registered and to consent to a broad range of medical research with a one-time consent um, anywhere in biobanks throughout Finland. And this enables also transfer of existing legacy collections, recontact of any individual who signs up um, into the national biobanking framework, as well as um, interface with healthcare and health registry data and interfaces with industry on, on this research. And that's been further um, strengthened in recent years. And so, of course, as in many of the Nordic configurations of biobanking, we have the opportunity that when we recruit and consent someone into this activity now, they are immediately phenotyped with a lifelong um, set of data 
that it will be very familiar to any of you from Nordic countries, that stretches back in Finland as much as 50 years in many cases with respect to hospitalization records, outpatient clinics, cancer, cause of death registries, and for the last 25 years, all prescription drug purchases as well. So this creates the wonderful opportunity, at least by my, you know, sort of non-Nordic ancestry, a really truly remarkable opportunity that, that brought me to Finland um, and, and brings me to this collaborative network um, across the Nordics, where we can take human genetics to the next level because of the type of phenotype data that we can interface with, with from the healthcare system. And so the FinGen project was emerged as Finland's version of a national biobank effort. And it links all biobanks and medical schools in Finland, um, is supported both from the Finnish government and from a, a um, network of 12 pharmaceutical companies that, that fund the project and, and interface on an intellectual level in the design and, and interpretation of it um, in a pre-competitive way. And of course, this first and foremost, and the next topic that I turn to briefly, um, respects the individual consent and has data protection and security as its primary, you know, above all other considerations, because obviously we cannot afford to, um, you know, sort of lose any of the trust of, of the population in this work and need to be constantly attentive to the, the changing landscape of data protection and data access um, requirements. And that's the topic I wanted to turn to briefly before turning over to more interesting things, um, which is that we've found a solution for this in Finland that I hope will um, you know, demonstrate that it may be possible for us to do this on a trans-Nordic level. And that is by developing a very secure computing environment that we describe as a, we call a sandbox, um, which is implemented in a, in a public cloud computing setting. Um, we can provide access to researchers from around the world. However, in a framework that is very restricted in terms of what they can do, they can come into the computing environment, they can run computing jobs on FinGen sensitive data, but one cannot copy the data. One, the, the access to this individual level genotype and medical phenotype data is of course of the highest and audited security. And to give a few more example, a, a little more detail about this, my computer stops freezing on me. Um, it's, you know, for the computers, computing folks among you, it's, it's, it's a simple interactive virtual machine each organization, each academic institution or hospital or, or industry partner gets their own instance of this sandbox. And within this, you can connect to the sensitive individual data and run analyses on it. Each individual, of course, has an independent account and has to be individually approved to gain access by the FinGen core team and by the Finnish national registers, all according to the Finnish law. And so there's nothing that would prevent us in a, in, a, in a different mode to allowing access to a central computing environment that had multiple groups sharing data in it, each of whom maintained their own access to their own data according to whatever local laws and legislations they require. Um, a lot more details. Basically, this is the only way to access individual genotype and phenotype data. It does not permit cutting and pasting. It does not permit direct export of files, any of those types of things. So security is, is highly you know, maintained and audited, but it does allow analysis to be done by all users who gain access to this. And you know, those can also develop their own tools, of course, but maintains that the data is always in one place, secure, and cannot be copied. Huge number of tools are available, and I won't go into any of the details on this. We've built our own tools to make it easier for less experienced computer users and clinicians and others to be able to query the data, to be able to explore the phenotype data, to be able to run their own GWASs even. And this is all you know, tools that could be shared. And I think it's possible that we can think about such an environment for trans-Nordic initiatives in which each country, as I said, can maintain their own access procedures and really instantiate what Kari has been talking about. And so if we turn our backs together and allow and create 
a framework in which we are actually genuinely sharing tools. We could then share data, tools, ideas in a common environment. There needs to be no change to any of our local laws and responsibilities within our own country regarding data protection and how access is granted. We just need the will to do this and to, to work together. And I think there's even already existing investments from our governments. So from the EU and from each of our Nordic governments, there have been several initiatives and investments already made in shared computing environments. And this one here, I'm not myself well-versed in it, but um, I had it described to me recently, seemed very promising in which each of 10 countries, including all six Nordics represented in the NSHG, have already significantly invested in computing infrastructure that is shared and could be available for such things and provide the level of security and, and, and still access in a meaningful way. Enough on that, let's talk about some interesting science, but I hope this, this provokes discussion that maybe it is possible that now we can think about how to make these data available more broadly and in a shared way. Um, so the FinGen pro uh, project has, has continued over the last couple of years. It continues building to date. We have internal data freezes every six months. This is roughly where the sample sizes are at right now with respect to FinGen genotype and phenotype. And we try to make data freezes of the results of these studies, not the data itself, of course, but results from all of the, the FinGen GWAS scans and so forth, public every six months. And, and you can go to this site and, and enjoy those if you are so inclined. So um, the, the last point before turning over to Yuka and Sani um, is that, of course, in addition to all of the advantages that are shared across the Nordics, um, we find in, in Finland, and, and I know Kari has described this also for Iceland, um, that isolation is a real advantage in the genetics activities that we are all engaged in. And that's because there's a huge number of ultra rare disease causing mutations segregating throughout the world. But when a population is founded in you know, the past you know, tens or hundreds of generations, um, if it has been founded through a bottleneck, as we say, Obviously, a small subset of those make it into the population. The vast majority of ultra rare variants don't make it into the isolated population. Those that do, however, expand to an unusually high frequency and give us great opportunities to look at, in what many cases are damaging variants, but at an exceptionally high frequency that one would not find in the broad panmictic population. And so we've known this to be the case with respect to Mendelian disease for many years. We've now begun to recognize that this is an important contributor also to common disease and that it's a far more widespread phenomenon than we expected. So Conrad, who's worked with me for years in, in Boston on the NOMAD project, um, has developed uh, you know, these analyses to characterize for each population how much unique content there might be. And in the case of the Finnish population, there is a remarkable number of even missense and loss of function variants that are at a common and easily tested population frequency in Finland that are much rarer in the general European population and would not be conventionally tested from genome-wide association studies. And so I think founder and also diverse populations that have been understudied have a huge and largely untapped potential for genetic discovery and in the case of Finland and the FinGen project, we have more than 50,000 missense variants that are highly enriched in, in Finland at the very low frequency in some cases, but they're now being analyzed for the first time. And that's the subject of what Yuka and Sani will be focused in on in their talks to follow. And so finally, I turn over now to, to Yuka and Sani to actually present something interesting that you might not have heard before. And so we start um, by introducing Yuka, who's a, a doctor and a genetics uh, researcher um, for many years uh, working with us at FIM. And he's going to introduce today a novel mechanism connecting pulmonary fibrosis and cancer. And so Yuka, let me turn the floor over to you now. Here we go. So yes, um, I'm 
as Mark said, I'm an I'm a emergency medicine doctor here at uh, Helsinki University Central Hospital and, and a researcher at FIM. And I'm going to be and give you a brief talk about something that we started off as an IPF research, but bumped into something that's uh, quite interesting as well. Uh, so briefly about uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, it's a rare condition that affects the lungs and alveoli structure in the lungs. So the lungs lose their elasticity and also uh, ability to do proper gas exchange. So it becomes very hard to breathe for these patients. IPF is a part of this ILD family with numerous conditions and, and um, classifications so uh, complex that I, I don't know how to print it out. But as the name implies, uh, IPF is idiopathic. So there is no known cause to the disease. It affects more males, more smokers, and typically onsets at about 60 years of age. The prognosis is poor unless uh, the patient gets a lung transplant, uh, we only expect to see three to four years. There are two new drug therapies for the disease uh, that seem to extend the uh, life expectancy by a few years, but offer, offer no relief to the symptoms. Uh, so far, the GWAS has identified about 20 many loci, uh, mostly from small studies that tend not to replicate in, in over the different studies. What's well known is a mucin 5B promoter that replicates it everywhere. And uh, last year, there was a, a one bigger meta-analysis published uh, with 4,000 patients with IPF. They found three new loci and uh, confirmed 11 of the 17 previous ones. In addition to the GWAS, there is a uh, number of uh, familial studies uh, that have identified um, mutations in surfactant genes and also in telomere-related genes that I'm going to touch upon shortly in this talk. So in Finjan uh, data release 7, we have some 1,500 patients with IPF, um, more than we'd expect based on the population prevalence. Uh, we have a, in a Finnish IPF registry study included in, the, uh, in Finjan uh, and of course, these are the kinds of, kinds of patients that we would expect to see from a biobank since they visit doctor's office very often. But for, uh, furthermore, there might be some um, excess patients with, with not actually IPF, but some other type of ILD within them. However, uh, looking at the GWAS scan from release seven, we get a quite a new, good looking scan and the new C5B there. Of course, but the, in addition, we have some new loci, and I'm going to mainly focus on to this SPDL1 over here, and again touch upon on, on, on the TRT, which is the most important uh, telomeres, telomerase um, encoding gene. Uh, so this SPDL1 locus actually maps to this missing variant uh, that's quite rare in other populations compared to Finland, and uh, we already noticed the, uh, that it, it, it replicates in the Allen meta-analysis paper, although they don't report it as it's below genome-wide significance. So this is uh, data from 2018 or 2019 when, we're, when we were starting up on this project and we were quite excited to see some new ILD or IPF uh, loci popping up. But when time passed and data accumulated, we, we started to see something that got us really excited. And it's that, uh, yes, we knew that it's a, a risk increasing variant for IPF, but then we noticed that it's, uh, it's risk decreasing for multiple types of cancer. And also that it, the gene uh, in the, it has 12 other coding variants in Finjan and not one of those is associated with IPF or cancer risk in Finch. So this is a longitudinal analysis uh, looking at two loci, this SPDL1, Mrs. variant, and then the TRT locus combining two very almost finished specific uh, coding variants. One is an LOF, 
the only recurrent uh, LOF in, in the GRT. And we noted that these actually exhibit the similar effects over cancer and IPF. So the uh, carrying a, uh, um, a, these coding mutations gives you an increased risk for IPF, but it's protective of cancer. And so here we've uh, divided the, the diseases based on the prevalence when you enter the study. If you've if you got a cancer before you enter Fingen, uh, then you're considered as prevalent. And if you develop it during Fingen, it's, a, it's an incident case of cancer. So then we started putting the pieces back uh, to, to the puzzle. And, and yes, we knew that it's a, it's a high, uh, risk mutation to uh, IPF and protective of cancer. And this way we replicated in a number of places, where, for example, the twin study at the UK Biobank but then uh, we were a bit surprised that uh, there was no effect on telomere length or some other cancer risk factors with the, with the variant. But then came a really important note from UK Biobank that, it, uh, that it's actually associated with less number, lower number of somatic loss of Y chromosome in the UK Biobank. And this gave us the idea that we started pursuing using a method um, developed by Julia Genovese from Broad, is that we took the uh, intensity data from array genotyping and called the mosaic chromosomal alternations from that data. Here's just the three types of uh, MCAs plotted over time so that you can see that the uh, somatic uh, mutations or their proportion is highly dependent on the age and the gender. But what, what, what's the point here is that we see that carrying this SPDL1 missense variant is associated with a decreased number of MCAs in Fingen. And then uh, encouraged by this, uh, we, uh, we pursued, uh, or we did a meta-analysis of pan-cancer, Juha Mehtanen, um, and colleagues did the actual analysis with so that we combined all cancer cases from UK Biobank and Fingen, uh, resulting in more, more than 110,000 patients with the disease, uh, identifying 63 independent genome wide uh, significant cancer loci. So then we took those lead variants and overlay them with the 2020 Allen IPF meta analysis results. And uh, we get 51 variants that overlap these two studies. And actually, six of them uh, replicate in the IPF meta analysis after multiple testing uh, correction. But what's most in interesting here is that all the effects for each of these lo loci are reversed again for cancer and IPF, as they were for SPDL1 and TERT. And all six loci have been previously uh, described to be uh, cell division associated. And the last three of the list here are also uh, telomere associated based on the literature. So then we know that it's a risk to IPF that replicates in, in the uh, meta-analysis protective of cancer and uh, includes 12, 12 other coding variants, but have, these have no effects on IP for cancer. And it's also protective of chromosomal uh, alternations, uh, which also replicates in the UK Biobank. And then from the literature, we, we know that uh, these alternations arise during mitosis and, and SPDL1 encoded protein is functional during the mitosis. So this is mere hypothesis, but as we know that uh, IPF is driven by cellular senescence, which is like stagnation of cell division. And this mutation is uh, associated with risky increase of IPF. But in contrast, cancer is driven by genomic instability and um, characterized by extreme cellular division. And this, uh, variant is decreasing, risk decreasing for cancer. So we, we hypothesize whether this could be actually be a gain of function mutation 
causing this extremely durable exotic spindle assembly. That remains to be seen. But that's where I end. I hope uh, you take a look at our uh, preprint on Merda Archive. And thanks to all these people who have uh, significantly, greatly uh, helped me within this project. That's all from me. Um, so welcome, Sanni. Sanni Rotelainen is um, a PhD student in Samuli Ripati's group, and she has been um, working expertly on a number of, of genetic analysis projects for the last few years. And she's going to introduce um, a, a new finding with respect to um, coronary atherosclerosis that comes forward from a similar source of, of data, uh, of the, the similar FinGen project, and similarly focusing on what are unique observations that emerge that are complementary to those that have been made previously. Welcome, Sanni. Hi, thanks. Hope you can all hear me and see my screen well. And thanks, Mark, for the introduction. So I'm going to start my story from the, from the Chivas results for, for coronary atherosclerosis in FinGen, in the sixth release of FinGen. And in, in that GWAS, we actually saw 37 independent genomoid significant loci, out of which three were novel for any, any cardiovascular related diseases or their risk factors. And so that was already quite a remarkable number. And then out of these three, our interest got, were very shortly going to the divides this MFGE18. And one reason, of, of course, is that, as you can see, that was the strongest no out of these three red colored novel signal for, for any CVD related endpoints. But also, the lead variant in that, in that signal was very very interesting. So that's an, uh, the lead variant is an inframe insertion, which is located in one of the exons of the MFGE8 gene, as you can see from the, from the figure on the top left. And interestingly, when we looked at the population frequencies of that variant, we could see that it's very highly finished and rich, almost 70 fold compared to the non finished Europeans but still relatively common in Finland with alert frequency about 3%. And when looking this variance association across the whole phenome, so there's almost 30 or 3000 endpoints tested in FinGen. So we can see that it's highly protective against many, many coronary atherosclerosis related Endpoint. So they are very specifically very ischemic and coronary atherosclerosis related endpoints. And it's all for all of these, it's protective. So we can't see any significant associations on the on the right side of the of this plot. So that this variant would be increasing the risk for any diseases significantly. So even though it's quite rare variant anywhere else except in Finland, we were able to, to get some carriers in Estonian Biobank and Biobank Japan. So in those, we were able to replicate the associations for both coronary arter artery diseases and MI with very consistent effect sizes across all the, all the these cohorts. So that's very promising. Next. We were curious to see if this variant is actually acting as a, as a loss of function, for example, in this gene. And since this variant, as you can see from the, from the title, it's actually a three phase insertion. So the, they are the common kind of common tools for getting functionality for the variants doesn't or are not as good for this variant as for you know, single nucleotide poluformis, poluformisin. So, but 
instead of having to do any actual functional studies, we were very happy or lucky to find a loss of function variant in this same gene, MFGE8. And this variant is also highly finish enriched, a little less common than, than the insertion, but still relatively, or we do have some power. And this is also highly protective against all these same disease endpoints as was the insertion with very similar effect sizes. But, and this is again independent of the insertion. It was also a good thing. So we then can see, say that these similar effect sizes between these two variants is not just because of their, because they are correlated, but they actually have their in, independent protective effects against these diseases. And thus we can, we were kind of more confident to say that the insertion actually acts similarly towards these endpoints as does the known loss of function of this, or loss of function variant of the same gene. And uh, it, beside the linkage disequilibrium, the independence of these variants were further validated through the conditional analysis. So we performed these similar GYCs for coronary atherosclerosis and, and MI conditioning on both of these variants to see that the associations stay similar even if we conditioned on the other variants. And that was the case. And here you can see the effect sizes and p-values for, for the infirm insertions and they stay very stable even, even if conditioned on the, on the loss of function and vice versa. So that also validated the functional, functionality of the infirm insertion. Next, we wanted to get hints on what would be the pathway on how, how this protective effect comes from. So we did very wide associations for all the risk factors for any cardiovascular related diseases across all the cohorts that we came up. And there was no associations for any traditional risk factors such as blood lipids or, or BMI, but we've, there was a an, an significant association for pulse pressure for the loss of function variant of this MFGE18. And that was actually interesting because these results are in line with the previous studies of this gene and also the elasticity and aging process of the arteries. And here's a quick overview on, on, the, on the literature review on the gene and arterial aging. So the protein called lactoderin, this gene encodes, is a known biomarker for aging arterial walls. And it has been shown to be an element of the arterial inflammatory signaling network. And also during the aging, the transcription and, and translation are increased, or this proteins transcription and translation have been increased within the arterial walls in various various species, including humans. So that all, all kind of validates the hypothesis that this would be the pathway, how, how the protective effect comes from. And also wanted to show an example of, we did also some survival analysis on between the carriers of either of these variants compared to non-carriers and as you can see, the, we can also see a, a remarkable decrease in the cumulative incidences of, of MI among the carriers compared to the non-carriers of, of any of the loss of function variants in this gene with very significant hazard ratio. So to conclude, we identified a novel protective association 
for coronary atherosclerosis and related endpoints, which is led by a functional Finnish enriched variant. And these results kind of say that the in or from or give us hints that the inhibiting the production of the lactoterine could decrease the risk for atherosclerotic cardiovascular diseases substantially, hypothetically by affecting the aging process of the arteries and without increasing risk for, for any diseases. And this study also highlights the advantages of these large biobank studies performed in the isolated population such as Finland and also the strong linkage to the electronic health records. And with this, I want to thank all the people who have been helping me, me through this project. And thank you all for your attention. Thanks, Anni. Excellent. Um, then uh, for the last section, I'm going to um, shift gears and um, introduce um, a, a different um, study taking place in Finland in the hopes that it will also be potentially a source of collaboration with many in the, in the, in the Nordics. Um, so oh, I guess I need to go back to the screen sharing myself. Um, so I start with um, a very brief um, introduction to where we as a field have gotten to in the genetics of schizophrenia over the last 10, 15 plus years. Um, a story that I'm sure many of you have heard before, so I will go quite quickly through that part and get to just introducing the, the new um, opportunities for collaboration in Finland that, that exist around this. So I think when we, many of us uh, years and years ago in, in schizophrenia started out on our um, journeys into the complex genetic architecture of, of such a phenotype, um, you know, when we go back 15 or 20 years, we really knew very, very little. Um, I think it has long been recognized that, that um, individuals uh, with the 22Q11 deletion um, syndrome have uh, had, a, you know, re reliably were observed to have a high incidence of schizophrenia. But this may, I think, for, uh, for quite many years have been the only truly robust finding with respect to the genetic predisposition to schizophrenia which as we all know is an extraordinarily highly heritable phenotype uniformly presenting with, with uh, high frequency and high heritability across the world. The next 10 years after that, I think you know, many of us were, were dedicated to mining what was possible from emerging array-based um, technologies. And this permitted both in parallel in different studies, the recognition of submicroscopic CNVs in much larger you know, quantities than we had previously appreciated they might exist, as well as common variants from genome-wide association studies. But the real challenge in, in both of these, the CNVs, because they often encompass 20 or 30 genes, the common variants, because they are often, you know, most often non-coding and not of any obvious functional consequence, was carrying these forward into biology and, and hard biological insights that we could carry forward has been difficult. And so we shifted gears as a field and, and I've been privileged to work with, with TJ Singh, a really industrious postdoc for the last five years who really came to, to work on this project, coordinating exome uh, sequencing efforts from around the world in the same spirit as um, the Genome-Wide Association Study Consortia had built up over the previous decade. And his work, which has been described and is available, as I said, on, on MedArchive for people to, to read and hopefully enjoy, um, I won't go into the details of. Obviously, it has focused primarily on ultra-rare variants and traditional burden tests. And the way that he, of course, approached it was by identifying categories of variants by annotation, by deleteriousness, and um, examining over the entire genome what the effect size of a category of variants was, and then using those as predetermined weights to evaluate the role of each individual gene, gene by gene. Um, and through this, in the, in the paper that's on MedArchive, there are 
10 what we would describe genome-wide or exome-wide significant genes, and a number of others, 22 or so, that are highly likely to be um, schizophrenia genes, but are not yet at a proven level of, of significance. And this gives us, you know, some, some clear pointers, some long-held hypothesis um, around um, NMDA receptors and then glutamate hypothesis in general, borne out by both the genome-wide association study and the ultra-rare coding variants independently pointing squarely at GRIN2A, for example, um, which interests um, in the, in me anyway in the construction of, of NMDA receptors where GRIN2A and GRIN2B kind of swap places, that prenatally GRIN2A, GRIN2B is the dominant form um, constructing NMDA receptors, postnatally and in childhood and development, GRIN2A becomes, and you can see they both have very strong associations, but in the case of GRIN2B, it's to autism and intellectual disability. In the case of GRIN2A, it's to schizophrenia. So nice, you know, beginnings of some nice insights, um, definitely far beyond the type of direct functional biological insights that we were getting from most of the, the genome-wide association results, as well as the CNVs. And in addition, there are other hits in the set of both GWAS and um, the uh, exome study that point also to NMDA receptors. Um, expectedly, I guess, at this point in time, it's not surprising to see that there is, in fact, some overlap between what rare variant signal emerges in schizophrenia and previously defined rare variant signal in intellectual disability, developmental delay, and autism. However, this sometimes takes on unique forms that give us further insights in that, for example, the case of TRIO, where loss of function variants are clearly and strongly associated to schizophrenia and um, sort of, you know, common forms of autism, whereas in more severe cases of intellectual disability and autism with intellectual disability, um, the signal comes almost entirely from specific missense variants in specific domains of the, of the gene, which are actually also documented to be reduced function mutations. So there's interesting work to follow here. Looking ahead though, and what I wanted to emphasize today in the brief, in the brief talk was the new collection that's taken place over the last years in, in Finland as a source of a potential um, jumping off point for deeper Nordic collaborations on psychiatry in general and schizophrenia specifically. And led by Arno and many in Finland, um, the, the what's termed the super project, um, don't try to read the, what the acronym SUPER stands for in Finnish behind there, um, has collected now more than 10,000 psychosis patients um, of all causes and all walks of life. And in fact, a great effort has been made to not have you know, any specific ascertainment bias or target, but to really try to collect cross-sectional and cross-national um, psychosis cases wherever they are in their life course and, and living conditions. And so that effort has been made to make individual contacts, to get complete clinical records, to get complete laboratory samples, perform cognitive testing and so forth. So as a resource, not simply for gene discovery, but that would allow us to now take the next steps beyond discovering genes and really interpreting the genes and variants and mutations that come from worldwide collaborative studies. Um, because such an effort was made to really reach patients um, in um, you know, supported living conditions, in hospitals, um, wherever they are in life, we have you know, a somewhat more severe um, you know, uh, spectrum of psychosis case cases than many studies, um, a quarter around clozapine, Many are in supported housing and, and, and so forth. Um, genetic data has been, of course, collected over the last year. It's, not, it's only now maturing into a, a complete data set. So it's not yet been included in, for example, the schema study that I just mentioned, but it will be in the next round. But it gives us a nice independent opportunity to now replicate the results of that schema publication. And in fact, you can see both for the highly significant set of 10 genes, as well as for um, other genes that are, you know, in that likely 
FDR category, but not yet certain, um, significant replicating signal is seen, especially for truncating mutations in the same exact genes as reported in the schema study. And this gives us a good um, lens into replication that I'll come to in a minute. The interesting thing is that we observe the signal not simply in the frank diagnosis of schizophrenia, but in the much more broad categories, such as schizoaffective disorders, psychosis, bipolar disorder with psychosis, the signal of truncating mutations in those genes is almost indistinguishable from that in the original schizophrenia samples. And so what we discover in a strictly defined schizophrenia cohort seems to be repeated almost to the same degree in other diagnoses of psychosis um, outside of that strict schizophrenia diagnosis. Um, and of course, what we see is additional evidence, very strong evidence of many genes and several that are pushed into a level of certainty by the addition of the super sample. For example, SETD1A is the most commonly mutated gene. And one thing that's particularly interesting about SETD1A is that a lot of the mutations, and these appear to be independently arising copies of the same mutation, happen to be the exact same um, uh, sort of deletion variant of two nucleotides, which um, eliminates a, a essential splice site. And we've actually documented already 12 copies of this specific variant in various studies, schema and intellectual disability and super studies throughout Finland. Um, reminding us that while ultra rare variant burden tests are you know, critically important, we need to be open to these observations that in fact, sometimes variants that occur five times or 10 times may carry the most compelling evidence, even if that's simply evidence that this is a highly mutable site in the genome. In addition, there's several new findings that are pushed into certain significance. Gene ACAP11 is now sort of validated by the, the Finnish collection as an independently significant uh, risk factor in both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which is quite interesting. And SRRM2 is identified in our schizophrenia cases, both published and this unpublished data, but in almost every case, we see that SRM2 is, is a gene that when severely mutated results in schizophrenia with comorbid intellectual disability or, or learning difficulties of various um, flavors. So we are hoping that with this type of collection and collaborative action across the Nordics, the NSHG may be able to promote the next level of studies of psychiatric disease that go beyond simply the worldwide gene discovery in case control format, but really allow us to take advantage of the medical history of the individuals, um, cognitive testing, the medication history of individuals, and the real life outcomes that are uniquely accessible with Nordic registry data, um, as well as, as, as potential environmental factors such as, such as manganese levels, such as been exposed by the, um, the coding variant in SLC39A8 as a potential causal factor in both schizophrenia and Parkinson's. So with that, I just um, sort of update the 2020 edition of, of the Schizophrenia Genetic Architecture slide, where now we begin to see the first population of individual genes. And while this is still very, very early days for the rare variant discovery in comparison to the common variant and, and CNV discovery, um, I think we are encouraged that the information that's obtained from specific mutations in specific genes is now giving us a leg up that the GWAS and the, and the CNV work was much more challenged to um, deliver with respect to functional hypotheses that can be pursued experimentally and move forward into, into further research. So thanks for all of my colleagues around the world working on this. And thanks, I think, um, especially to Yuka and Sani for giving such great examples of how the Finnish resources are being employed um, now in a variety of, of different research settings. So with that, let's um, open up for questions and the 
panel discussion. If uh, Sani and uh, uh, Yuga could also turn on your cameras, then we could have the, the three speakers initially and the other pan panelists, uh, please wait, uh, turn on your microphones as well. And there is a question, uh, as I mentioned, Mark from Miles Axton about um, countries <coughs> and initiatives that don't have the resources, but have the founder populations. Where, what do, where do you start to get your initial bang for the buck, so to speak? Yeah, um, so the the Indian subcontinent is is fascinating from a population genetic standpoint, in that there are a lot of sort of individual um, you know endogamous uh, groups that have population features um, that could be very very valuable to employ um, in this setting. Um, so I don't know so much that it's that is necessarily a, a Finnish strategy that that could be employed but i think you know the the you know what i think makes our activities most successful is is not only being able to you know build genetic resources but also to find ways to make them available to a a wide set of of researchers um to bring innovative analytic ideas and and hypotheses um, that can be tested on on those, and I think all of us have uh, you know have had the experience that when we are more open to this type of collaborative activity, we get the benefit from that because other people are bringing their best ideas and tools and and hypotheses to our data resources, and the whole is enriched. I'll remind uh, the audience that uh, you can submit questions uh, at the Q&A box uh, at the bottom of your screen. And uh, another question from uh, Miles, who's keeping things going. Uh, Mark, is the GNOME AD population frequency approach going to work across Nordic populations in the larger psychosis surveys? How can large immigrant populations contribute or are burden tests proof against population diversity? Our burden tests, I, I don't quite understand the last part of the question, our burden tests proof against population diversity. So I think, you know, we're committed to, I mean, at this point in time, uh, Nordic populations are highly overrepresented in the, in the nomad resource compared to their, um, you know, global population pr proportion, because there's been quite many, you know, research studies conducted in, um, you know, throughout the Nordics uh, that have, you know, shared sequence and, and um, information and frequency information with these types of, of resources. Um, so the explanation, population baseline plays into any test of affected population. Absolutely. I mean, the population baseline is, is a key for many of these types of things. I think with respect to, you know, what are largely de novo mutations um, and, and very recent mutations, um, arising, which arise at, at roughly equal, equal frequency everywhere in the world, and in a common disease such as schizophrenia, which has a high and equal prevalence, roughly speaking, in all populations of the world. I think this is probably the one scenario where, you know, there is least concern about um, the, you know, the fact that, or it's, it's easiest to integrate um, uh, populations from around the world in such an analysis. Um, but generally speaking, I think, you know, it's, it's a, a clear and important goal that not only are we conducting genetic studies in the most diverse samples, but that we have methodology that is actually up to the task of extracting the largest, you know, the, the most information in a reliable way from those diverse samples. And many of our existing methods are not quite up to that task at this point. So a certain in trios, uh, uh, exclamation point, says Miles. <laughs> ascertain in trios, yes, if we could ascertain trios for, you know, all diseases, it would be great. I think for many adult onset and, and late onset diseases, it's a lot more difficult to do so, um, but, I'll ask uh, then that the panelists, um, if you would turn on your cameras and your microphones, and uh, we can, uh, if, Kari, if you're there, we could you yes. begin with comments and questions? Um, uh, Mark, I think that your statement 
that the no mutations occur at the same frequency all over the world is probably not correct because the age of others is substantially higher in the western part of the world in the developed countries than in the less developed countries. So, so there is a certain there is a certain justice. Okay. In the fact that there is probably more accumulation of you know mutations in in our African part of the world than in the, the third world, but I think that this this approach uh, that uh, isn't all that different from what we have done in Iceland over the past twenty five years is extraordinarily valuable and particularly because if you look at the if you look at the field for the moment. What we are particularly missing, not just in psychiatric diseases, not just in schizophrenia, but in almost all diseases, is our, our data on progression. Because it, it turns out to, for example, when you look at diseases like Alzheimer's disease, that the event that leads to the initiation of the disease appears to be different from the things that drive the progression. So having, having uh, data like you guys are gathering now on schizophrenia is extraordinarily precious to be able not just to, to uh, make discoveries, not just to validate discoveries, but also to follow their, their clinical course. And, um, and I think that this is beautiful. I think that FinGen is a, is a beautiful resource that we, we are using a lot. And, and uh, I'm very impressed with the uh, schizophrenia initiative in particular. Thanks, Gary. I think you're absolutely correct on, on, on all fronts. Of course, the, the, the age of the father and other factors are, are well known to contribute to the, the I mean, mutation. There's, there's just one comment on, on Miles' question about India. Mm -hmm. Apparently, there are Currently, there are substantial societal obstacles to the study of, of genetics in India, and, and they have to be overcome before you can begin systematically to, uh, to apply strategy like this in India. There, there are some attempts. We have been approached by groups in, in India asking us to work with them, and, and we are exploring that. Mm -hmm. But it is, it is not... It, it's, a, it's a little bit difficult for the moment. Yeah, that's certainly been my experience as, as well as in, in discussing this with, with researchers in, in India. Um, and I think, yes, and, and, and I, I certainly echo your, your sentiment about, you know, I, I think I brought forward the, the psychosis collection discussion as an example, because I think it's, you know, the type of thing where you know, we in the Nordics have a unique opportunity to potentially work together um, and, and, you know, sort of following, you know, what, what you have charted, Gary, at, at Decode, um, by not only being able to recruit and follow and recontact and really be engaged with, with the research participants, but having the opportunity to bring in the life history from all the medical registry data and the medications and so forth are things that that really no one else can do and if we really work together it would be a profoundly impactful to the world i think christian vm from uh, norwegian technical university uh, uh, would you like to have some comments and questions uh, yes, thank you, Hakon. Uh, it must be a more general comment to the results presented by FinGene and their discoveries. And as I also pointed out, I'm uh, extremely impressed by not only the opportunities that lies in the uh, bottleneck uh, situation for the Finnish population, but uh, what you put together at FIM and, and FinGene. And especially um, these days, when we all struggle with the GDPR issues and uh, try to orchestrate a good collaboration between um, uh, public and private uh, contributors, I think you, you have uh, been able to put together a model in Finland that's uh, very, very uh, impressive. And I'm also impressed by the Finnish population. Um, that you're moving so fast towards your goals. I mean, you've been overfilling your goals. So 
participation numbers uh, perhaps the year ahead and probably also continue to collect more data, more information. Uh, I also learned that you are now revising your Biobank Act, which has worked very well um, up till now. So um, if somebody could comment on that, what, what this revision will, will contain and, uh, and um, what are your further plans? Uh, that would be also interesting to learn something about. Um, great. Yes. I mean, I think, uh, you know, we, we plan to, you know, obviously continue to proceed with the research as, as, you know, swiftly and responsibly as is possible. I think as with all of us, we constantly are monitoring within each of our countries, you know, what, the changing landscape of, of data protection rules and, and access rules and so forth are so that we can maintain, you know, the, you know, commitment to the population and the commitment to government that we do everything by the books. Um, this takes a lot of effort. I know, you know, Arno is here and I don't know if maybe um, Arno is, is saying that the new act is still in discussion. I don't know, Arno, maybe is, is it possible for him to unmute and discuss this? Because many of these discussions, of course, take place in Finnish, and I can't really be much of a participant in that at this point in time, unfortunately. Um, Nico, is that possible okay. to unmute uh, Arno? He is unmuted. Yes, yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Thank you. So in short, um, uh, the idea with the uh, uh, new uh, renewal of the Biobank Act was just to harmonize it with the GDPR. Uh, slightly, I can be honest that uh, unfortunately there seems to be some uh, political pressure to tighten some things and, and we uh, experts around are, are doing a lot of work to trying to to bring uh, sanity to is, this and, and this has a background where uh, the previous act was, was done with another government and, and this government wants to show their teeth again and, and without going into details. So we are discussing this a lot. Maybe we could move to Tonya Esko then uh, for some initial comments and any questions for the panelists. Yes, thanks. And uh, yeah, good. Uh, Good to hear the updates always uh, from Finland and uh, makes us from the other side of the call always super envious. Um, yeah, I wanted to um, uh, comment or add on you know what what Arno you know said about you know the the biobanking act. So the the same thing is ongoing in Estonia and and similarly in the light of GDPR, you know the politicians are you know more eager to you know <clears throat> close down the the access. But I think it's important for us to, as a society, to uh, achieve that you know it's it remains you know still reasonably open, and that we work towards you know getting it more easier to access uh, you know uh, the, all national records on, on on health data. It doesn't have to always be linked with uh, with the biomedical uh, data, but to, in order to for example, develop production services around personalized medicine, you know, prediction, uh, stratified uh, uh, screening studies, uh, so on and so forth. It actually requires us to have more uh, access. But then maybe a question again to Mark and the other panelists as well, you know, in the light of the GDPR and also in the light of having uh, more and more genome data become available and also the technology to run the genomes in large scale, uh, it seems that, you know, the, the public, uh, with the non-public clouds are becoming the bottleneck. I know that Mark represented this LUMI initiative, but in many, many cases, you know, this infrastructure doesn't support, you know, processing of uh, many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of, uh, of genomes. And uh, so what are Mark your thoughts or others, you know, around uh, using the, the public clouds, you know, the Google, Amazon, uh, and how to, you know, ensure that uh, 
you know the the privacy is is uh, kept and and security at the highest level yeah it's a it's a great question i mean it, it's a, it is a constant challenge and we we are certainly you know face this even at the at the outset of fingen because there's always this sort of strange sense that that if you you know that that the people reviewing the project have or in the government have that if we somehow you know managed you know if we kept the data on our own computer it would somehow be more secure than if we used a public cloud provider and obviously this is a this is a laughably naive view we can't possibly in fim or or really anywhere in 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 within you know a local computing environment in finland build something that would be as secure as as what you know a public cloud can provide us and so we've worked very hard to to have our solution be fully audited and get you know full buy in from the stakeholders in finland that in fact you know having the finnish data you know on a you know an instance of google with all of the security being you know fully audited and fully in the finnish hands and the data always remaining in the eu with respect to where it's stored um has met all the the requirements but i think as you as you heard you know it, it's i think we all you know these are always things that are being constantly reviewed and new laws and and, and you know people finding opportunities to restrict you know um access because they feel you know safety is is first and safety is first but i think we need to also be take some of the responsibility on ourselves to be more active in explaining to the public and explaining to all of the government actors why it's so important what the benefits are to having this data be available to research and having our research be collaborative and that there should not be anyone who sees it as a threat that we might share data across nordic countries rather it's a tremendous opportunity that together we could make much more progress for both research and clinical applications of the data and we should turn the dialogue to one that it should be expected that we have these collaborative activities there should need to be an excuse why we don't collaborate and share data it should not be the exception that we need to defend but we need to make it much more the mindset that this has to be how we act because it results in the best science and the best medicine. Mark, I have one question for you. Yes. You see, uh, one of the things we have to do when we are trying to uh, uh, trying to convince the public in the Nordic countries to allow us access to data like this is to try to put together some sort of an assessment of what the price would be in the case of a catastrophe, all right? Mm -hmm. What happens if people get access to to our data? And and one way to do this is to extrapolate the past. And for example, can you give me many instances where biomedical data that have been gathered for research purposes has been used to harm people? You know, are there many examples of that in the Nordic countries? I don't know of a singular one. I don't either. No, it's a it's a great point, and and I, I had this discussion many times with people about even sharing the summary statistics. And well, some really strange thing could happen. There's absolutely no example in history where sharing of summary statistics or or biomedical data, even of, of as you described, has resulted in some terrible catastrophe. But. Yeah, so I think we really have to drive the discussion, and I think if we, in our own countries, take command of the talking points and really drive the discussion, you know, to towards facts and towards you know results, we can we can also, do this. Also, put the discussion in the context of the universal access to healthcare in yes. the Nordic countries. When we when we go to institutions of healthcare, when we go to a hospital, the reason that we can expect to get some sort of a solution to our problem is that those who came before us allowed access to their data 
to make discoveries that have turned into methods to diagnose and treat. And when we put the discussion into that context, particularly in our countries, yes, I, I think it must be listened to. Absolutely. Yuka, Yuka, did you have a, a point that you wanted to talk about just now? Uh, well, not exactly. I'm new to this discussion and, and this trip, but, uh, but I think it, it could be useful to, uh, to come up with some form of statement that we could use across countries to show that we're united in doing this collaborative research and they, they uh, see the potential that, that lies within it. Um, it, it could be also uh, an easier way to, uh, to come up with all the best ideas to do it together and then deliver it. This I was there's something else. Yeah, no, I think it's a very good idea. And I think, you know, many of Kauri's words just a moment ago is, is a great framing of that in the, in the context of, of universal access to healthcare and how we have as a medical community made the advances that everyone benefits from today. Could we move to Ulla Andreessen uh, for some uh, comments uh, before we go back then to Red Stefansson and then we can open up to more general conversation. Thanks. So um, I'm Ulla Andreessen from uh, Norway and I work in uh, mental illness and just a comment uh, to you, Mark, about schizophrenia discoveries. I really like this uh, and uh, we're happy to uh, have this as uh, like a Nordic uh, use case and um, and I, I think you also highlighted uh, quite an important point that these general population based uh, samples uh, popping up everywhere they tend to overlook people with severe diseases because they are not part of the kind of regular recruitment strategy so I think we still need to do that kind of hospital recruitment uh, as you you showed and I think that is also uh, you know but you have, have done a great job I think there there are also some uh, samples you know in other Nordic countries but I don't think we have the same numbers uh, as you have but we are trying to get there and I think this would be a great opportunity thanks then, uh, so how can I have a couple of questions? I, I think it was Anja and Yuka gave uh, very great presentations. Could I have some questions for them now, or how should we do this? Please, please. Yeah. So, 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 uh, Yuka, you know, you you talked about this uh, SPDL one risk and was some kind of pulmonary and and cancer uh, kind of sort of, but yeah, the the concept uh, that could this be like a proxy for some kind of life uh, style, uh, kind of that, uh, you know, you, you know, the classical uh, work from uh, from Decode about uh, the, the uh, this nicotine kind of addiction uh, making and you know, linked to, to pulmonary cancer. Are you able to look into kind of uh, lifestyle factors? Well, some. Uh, we have some uh, lifestyle factors like smoking and, and uh, obesity, and it seems not to be associated with the most obvious uh, cancer risk factors. Um, however, there might be some that were overlooked, but uh, there's no absolutely a clear link with, between those. Okay, good. Thanks. And then, Sunday, so you... You said you had a very good, uh, I like this kind of prediction of, uh, of uh, future heart uh, disease. So, but since this is a, also a precision medicine uh, kind of setting, so how, how do you see your findings uh, moving into kind of targeted uh, intervention or, or uh, kind of, um, what do you call it, uh, finding the right treatment for a given patient, do you think there will be some specifics for, for Finland or, or do you think these, how can you put this into more like a, a clinical implication? Yeah, I, I see this is like as a high, very highly like potential drug target, like very similar to like PCSK9 or that kind of, I see high potential in regarding that and, but, and I, I see that if if there would be like a truck targeting this, I think it would be like in general. I don't think 
that would be like Finnish specific. I think that would be like in general the kind of the effect of of kind of the inhibition of of this protein, if that's what you mean. Yeah, and yeah. could you then develop this in your kind of uh, go back and see, look for outcome uh, for uh, bigger samples in your registry data? Can you can you get sort of test these variants uh, in new samples where you have uh, kind of long term data on outcome or previous diseases and stuff? Yeah, well, I think in fin yeah, basically in Finland, yeah, the kind of follow up is kind of yeah, that's not, but yeah, we have some like sub collect like the legacy cohorts in in. In general, that has some follow up data, but they are much, of course, like very small or smaller, smaller data set. And and actually, don't know if there would be any in in a large scale data set that <clears throat> at least doesn't come to my mind at this point. Mm. Yeah, I think embedded in FinGen are a number of the sort of long standing epidemiologic cohorts such as. FinRisk and Twins and a number of others, Health 2000, where there's, you know, many, some companies 20, 30 years ago, um, extensive, you know, quantitative trait data and clinical data collected. And then, you know, now the opportunity to look at long-term outcomes. So I think there's the possibility to dive in more deeply, um, you know, which takes some, some work that, data from those cohorts inherently is not sort of part of FinGen, but it's definitely now possible to carry the genetic results out of FinGen into these more specialized cohort scenarios. Um, can we move to uh, Rein Stefansson in Iceland now for comments and questions? Thank you, Hakon. I have a question for you, and another, for, another one for Mark. So let me start with you, Yoka. Thank you for an excellent presentation. and. Uh, 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 the question I had is a little bit based on what Uli was asking about earlier. So uh, you mentioned that uh, a variant in the MAH gene was associated with IPF. And since Uli was asking about lifestyle, <clears throat> so the inverted chromosome, the H2 chromosome, is um, associated with worse lifestyle. Uh, somewhat lower uh, cognitive abilities, uh, uh, more obesity, and kind of worse lifestyle in general. So the variant that you have on chromosome 17 on the inverted uh, region in the MAH gene, is that associated with H1 uh, or H2? And uh, does the variant uh, come risk also against the uh, uh, risk of, of uh, Parkinson's and frontal lobe dementia or, or protect against the same? Uh, I, I couldn't hear you properly, but it, was it the MAP uh, uh, variant that you were asking about? That's something actually that, that we only now see in FinGen. Um, it's been reported with, associated with IPF before, and I think it's one of those that are as well considered as uh, somehow spindle associated. I don't know about its other so, um, previous um, associations. Um, what was the other, other locus that you mentioned? No, it was only the, the inverted inversion, whether it was on the H2 uh, uh, chromosome or, or the, uh, on the inverted chromosome or the uh, or original chromosome. So, because I put, uh, Tell us a little bit about the lifestyle. If it is on the H2, then it should be associated with worse lifestyle, for instance. Oh. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I, and I, I don't know how to answer that. OK, thank you. <laughs> so the question I have for Mark is, uh, so some of the uh, variants, the loss of function variants that you mentioned, uh, come for risk of both schizophrenia and intellectual disability. So does the confluence of common variants that come the risk of schizophrenia dictate whether the phenotype turns out to be uh, schizophrenia 
or intellectual disability. So those with higher PRS score for schizophrenia and carrying these loss of function variants, are they more likely to be schizophrenic or have you looked into that? That's exactly the hypothesis that we are we are now testing. The analysis has not been done yet, but it's exactly what we are looking for. I think one of the the challenges and that we the, we try to take advantage of um, in uh, with the the Finnish resources that we don't have we have you know even in the case of super we have only specifically ascertained samples. So we have an intellectual disability cohort uh, from Northern Finland. We have the psychosis cohort. We don't have a lot of sequencing on unascertained individuals that would sort of fill out the distribution. But our expectation is that is, it, should, it should look exactly like uh, you describe. We have seen this for a few of the, the CNVs to, to a large extent, but you know the, the numbers are not yet sufficiently convincing because the, the PRS is, you know, useful, but it has a long way to go in terms of, of capturing the, the, the full, you know, genetic background. To follow up on this, so the other variants, uh, at least six or maybe more, that associate with schizophrenia, all the genes, I mean, uh, uh, loss of function variants in, in those genes, uh, <clears throat> that do not associate with uh, uh, intellectual disability. Uh, so, have you looked at cognition in uh, carriers of those variants? Is cognition uh, worse or cognitive ability worse in those, even though, though they don't associate with uh, intellectual disability necessarily? So on bulk in the in the super collection where we have the cognitive information um, testing, it does appear that way, that, they, that there's a higher burden in schizophrenia plus cognitive impairment across the board. For the individual genes, we don't have a sufficient number of, of mutations in each of them to test them one by one at this point. On bulk, it does appear that there's a shift in that direction. Um, have you looked at it in controls, not only in schizophrenics, but in controls, if cognition is worse? Of those variants? We have too few, you know, in, in for the majority of these, you know, the, the number of sequenced controls that we have in Finland, there's, there's generally zero or one um, observed mutation. So there's really not enough to, to tell us anything. And we don't have a consistent cognitive testing outside of the context of the, the super cohort. So the, I think you, you would, uh, you know, with, with the large scale testing you've done in, in Iceland on a broader population would have a better opportunity to, to look at that um, question. You know, we don't have, you know, a systematic cognitive testing on an unascertained population large enough to, to have any meaningful number of copies. Thank you. We have a few extra minutes uh, if there are any um, last questions or comments from the panel. Uh, otherwise, we will um, say thank you to Mark and Sunny and Yuka and to the panelists. And uh, we will uh, say goodbye for this year in terms of webinars and um, hope that uh, you will join us in Helsinki in, uh, in November with uh, uh, hosted by Mark and colleagues, and uh, we'll let you know uh, when our season will begin with webinars again, uh, most likely in September. Thank you. Everyone. Mark and you guys from Finland, this was spectacular. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dari. It was great to great to be here, and thanks everyone for uh, for joining and and participating in the questions.